I'm Gunsali, um, and today I would like to present, um, also if there's any point you can't hear my voice at the back, just wave at me and I'll try and remember. Um, but today I'd like to present a work in progress that I call Cryptid, a theory of post-digital selfhood. Um, in order to do this, I'm going to break down the cryptid into the following. So firstly, I'll introduce the cryptid as that which exists between reality and fantasy. Um, it's a creature that's defined by the ongoing patchwork of stories surrounding it. I will then explore the cryptid as a prime example of myth-making, an internet folklore that reflects our collective fears, anxieties, and desires. Then I'm going to look at the cryptid as a form of post-digital identity before situating it in the wider context of the non-human by looking at how we can use the cryptid to carve out a more compassionate understanding of the world and its inhabitants. So to begin, uh, first of all, what is a cryptid? Um, a cryptid is an animal that may or may not exist. Unproven by science and chronicled through anecdotal stories passed down through word of mouth, tales of such mythological creatures have captured our imagination for centuries. And like most folk stories and urban legends, typically, typically reflect our innermost fears and desires. These slippery and undefinable animals take many shapes. They can be semi-divine spirits, malevolent tricksters and sci-fi monsters. You're probably familiar with the Mothman, Loch Ness Monster, um, any kind of fantasy creature whose existence has yet to be proven falls under this umbrella. But at its most basic, the cryptid is simply unknowable. It occupies a strange interdimensional zone between fantasy and reality. Its mysterious and peculiar presence is comparable to those anomalous experiences associated with the paranormal, occult, and psychedelics. So, for this reason, the cryptid plays a very important role within pop culture, especially now, um, and especially within our current post-truth landscape. Um, it evokes the sort of questions that probe us to question what's real, what's out there. Um, one, one quote that I find particularly helpful for this is in High Weirdness, the 2019 book by Eric Davis. He points out that the intertwining of reality and fantasy has become a crucial feature of what some scholars of religion now identify as postmodern or hyperreal religion. And nowhere is this more prevalent than in the realm of the unknown. So, um, in his 1933 essay, Some Notes on a Non-Entity, um, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, the famous horror writer, writes, the punch of a truly weird tale is simply some violation or transcending of a fixed cosmic law, an imaginative escape from appalling reality. Similarly, we cannot fully comprehend the cryptid because it exists outside of our human understanding, or at least the signs and signifiers we use to understand the world. In this very in-betweenness that makes the cryptid um, is an innately alienating aesthetic category. We cannot define it, so it challenges the categories we use to comprehend it. So to imagine the cryptid takes us outside of the representational and into the liminal, the intensive. So in this context, stories of cryptids almost kind of function as a cosmic fiction, an ontological tool to expose the cracks in our consensus reality, um, something that we've seen breaking down across the last 10 years, especially through social media. Um, we see this through um, like kind of official news sources being replaced by um, more fringe sources such as social media, um, such as like TikTok, Twitter, and so on. Um, especially as we kind of like downstream into dark forest um, kind of communities. Um, another quote that I find helpful to kind of contextualize this is by Timothy Morton. Um, who says that in the term weird, there flickers a dark pathway between causality and the aesthetic dimension, between doing and appearing, a pathway that dominant Western philosophy has blocked and suppressed. So now that we've introduced the cryptid, um, I'd like to explore the idea of the cryptid as a tool for myth-making. Um, so like all urban legends and folklore, the cryptid is defined by the patchwork of stories surrounding it. Um, obviously, this myth-making is one of the most ancient human traditions. It dates back to the earliest stories of beasts and folk creatures told around a fire and passed down through generations. The modern classification system um, of plants and animals began in the 18th century. Uh, but before then, medieval beasteries contained detailed descriptions and illustrations of wild animals taken from verbal accounts, though this has since been replaced by scientific reason. 
One thing I find especially interesting about the medieval beasteries, this is a nice little screenshot up here, um, is that any kind of explorer or traveler could basically like say an account of what they'd found and immediately you'd get a group of artists just like kind of drawing it out and um, like there wasn't any question of whether it existed or not but it kind of like immediately fell into like the tapestry of kind of knowledge that was kind of being extended through these um, texts. So um, in our current era of unreality, however, it's easy to see how cryptids have ignited the attention of online cryptozoology communities and conspiracy theorists alike. Um, examples, one of my favorite Reddits is the Reddit cryptozoology um, community. I highly recommend everyone to check it out. Um, they kind of have like an X-Files style monster of the week format, um, which is very exciting and also includes some like very important do's and don'ts for what a um, vigilant cryptid hunter must do. Um, anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, anyway, stories of strange creatures take shape across social media and online forums where users post sightings, recordings, conversations, and lists to an ever-evolving fandom of dedicated researchers. Each like, post, and share adds to the lore surrounding them, and there's an innately mimetic contagion to these ideas which is no doubt exacerbated by the rapid pace of the internet. It's within this feedback loop of networked myth building that the cryptid truly comes into its own. So with over 2.3 billion likes on TikTok, cryptid sightings are gaining popularity there too. Um, though admittedly, the attention is less on the creatures themselves and more on the aesthetics surrounding them. In these clips, users romanticize hunting for Bigfoot in the great American outdoors, with much of the aesthetic drawing from paranormal pop culture shows such as Twin Peaks and The X-Files. The term cryptid core is an extension of this, spawning countless get ready with me videos of people dressed in cargo pants and utility gear, usually juxtaposed with images of newspaper clippings, detective crazy walls, and vintage snaps of small town outskirts. Um, there's even an aesthetics, oh yeah, these are some cryptids. <laughs> Um, there's even an aesthetics wiki entry about this aesthetic, which lists the following attributes. Um, dark forest, VHS tapes, kitschy t-shirts, alien imagery, supernatural tourist traps, and of course, tin hats. So for the average Mothman enjoyer, these clips are the perfect entry points into the weirder corners of social media, characterized by online trends such as weirdcore and aesthetics centered on low quality visuals that evoke feelings of disorientation, dread, and alienation. Stories of Jersey devils, frogmen, folk creatures follow a similar mimetic pattern to URL urban legends such as the Backrooms or Zalgo text, both core characteristics of liminal TikTok um, as seen by the Backrooms up there. Their uncanny ability to conjure an alienated familiar familiarity in its user. Um, but the desire to uncover hidden truths extends across our post-truth landscape. From the tin hat conspiracies we consume to the ongoing fascination with creepy pastors like Slenderman and Loa, the um, creepy AI thing that went viral, um, I think it was earlier this year. Um, and not to mention the euphoria or alien mania kind of sweeping across the mainstream. Um, these are also key characteristics of the cryptid core aesthetics as per the, um, the aesthetics wiki entry. Um, whether these creatures actually exist isn't particularly important, but what counts is what they tell us about ourselves. When observing the current state of the planet and the crises we face, of which there are many, climate change, social inequality, and rapid technological acceleration, the cryptid plays an interesting role in dissol dissolving the hierarchies between realities, collapsing the conceptual codes, social, ecological, and ontological that govern us and give us a terrifying glimpse into the intense and bizarre world we currently inhabit. Um, just to provide some examples for background as well, um, one such example that comes into mind is of obviously artificial intelligence, um, which is completely scrambling our sense of temporality through discoveries of ancient languages and artifacts. We see a similar phenomena unfurl in the fields of science too. Um, so researchers are currently resurrecting dodos and mammoths defrosting paleolithic worms and rolling out large tanks of algae dubbed liquid trees across major cities in Serbia. Um, and again, all of this adds to the stranger than fiction reality that we currently inhabit. So now that we've looked at the cryptid as myth making, um, I want to kind of pedal back a bit and look at what the cryptid can tell us about ourselves and especially our digital identities. 
Um, so if we rewind a little to the part where we mentioned the cryptid as existing in the spaces between reality and fantasy, um, that's the kind of crux to focus on. So for most of us, our digital selves form the crux of how we want to present ourselves to the world. Um, we have become our own myth-making factories in what Schumann Bassar refers to as law core, characterized by people's existential need to storify themselves at the very moment global narratives collapse in an unprecedented manner. So just like the cryptid, who is defined by the ever-expanding feedback loops of mythology surrounding it, we too are built on law. We laugh our identities in much the same way as a role player laughs a character. And to quote Lawcore again, your social media feeds are a factory of myth-making. Law is the new myth you make about yourself. You live inside these myths mythically. So now that we've established the parallels between ourselves and cryptids, let's look at how we can use this fictioning to carve out a more compassionate view of the world and its inhabitants habitants so that we don't fall into a self-mythologizing spiral of doom. Um, I think it's quite easy um, when we are kind of constantly storifying our lives in like the form of autofiction to kind of fall into a spiral of nihilism or solipsism. Um, and so I think it's really important to kind of maybe use the symbolism of the cryptid um, to kind of find a way out of this and to kind of be, to find a more kind of compassionate view that encompasses both human and non-human. Um, worlds. So one way storytelling does this is by suspending our linear conception of temporality and in doing so unlocking a multitude of realities that encompass the material and immaterial, fact and fiction, past and future. In Zeno-feminist teaching, for instance, the, prim the primacy of human ph phenomenological experience of time is no longer sufficient for how we organize, inflect and orient the systems we have created because these systems function on scales beyond the experiential capacity of the human. Stepping out of the human, stepping out of human time then enables a necessary and productive alienation between our experience and our knowledge that broadens how we think about the very idea of the future and how we might go about constructing it. But let's pause for a moment again and boil the cryptid down to its bare essentials. That is a creature whose existence is simply unproven. And while it's true that fictioning can help us to understand the unknowable, there's more to cryptids than frogmen, devils, and folk creatures. Um, there's countless species undiscovered by humans. Um, nearly 86% of all plants and animals on land and 91% of those on seas have yet to be named or catalogued, which means that there's countless cryptids on Earth whose existence has yet to be proven. As one of the largest and least understood habitats on Earth, the ocean is likely home to the largest number of living cryptids out there. With only 15% of the oceans mapped, their sheer vastness means that a majority of its inhabitants will likely remain out of reach. These deep sea creatures might as well be fictional, for even contemplating their existence requires us to imagine a world beyond our own, or as Kenrick Gallardo McDowell puts it, an act of becoming other than ourselves. But the ocean itself also operates as its own mythical body, and hosts an interconnected web of stories of inhabitants whose language is different and unknowable and therefore beyond our control. It's these creatures whose narrative pathways have been forever rerouted by our actions in what is commonly referred to as the Anthropocene. So language ultimately shapes how we perceive the world and it's through modern day taxonomy and its arbitrary groupings that we limit our understanding of the non-human entities around us. And it's important to remember the kind of undefinable nature of cryptids here as well. Um, so for McDowell, the world is full of unseen inhabitants or cryptids who we take for granted, unless something reaches out to remind us that without them, we too would die. <clears throat> Moving forward requires us to disorientate the human experience and adopt a radical empiricism as suggested by Bruno Latour and map out many modes of being in the world to allow for more diversity in the beings admitted into existence. One way to tackle this is through the lens of queer ecology, which challenges traditional ideas regarding which organisms, species, and individuals have value. Another path is what Alado McDowell refers to as cybernetic animism, um, which is a personal favorite of mine, <laughs> which uses computational design to imagine a material world beyond human cognition. In this context, it is no longer man versus nature, 
but rather the one fold of plants, animals, humans, etc., bringing these entities into communication, which reveals them to be subjects like us, in other words, secretly human. So to conclude, perhaps it's through our encounters with the unknown, the cryptic, the otherworldly, that we can commune with nature, tapping into the millennia old magic to embrace the ineffable. Kind of race through that, I think. <laughs> <laughs>